Good evening. It's a privilege for me to present Dr. Farkas Rom in order to to show to to show us a video about a new product, a new nicotine product, which is very interesting. So we are going to see the video. Unfortunately, Dr. Farkas Rom is uh, not going to answer the questions. But if you have any questions, please put them and I will send them to him in order to, uh, to have an answer for it. So we begin with Dr. Fagerstrom. My name is Carl Fagerstrom. I'm very happy to be able to present in this very nice conference. And uh, I will give a talk on the new nicotine oral pouches. And this is my disclosure. So first I'd like to show the uh, nicotine replacement products that we have available. We have many of them as you can see here and all products are efficacious, but its efficacy is moderate and uh, its interest for the smokers and uptake is quite limited. They usually come in low dose and smokers have difficult to substitute for the nicotine from cigarettes that they are losing. Uh, nicotine can also, particularly for the gum and the lozenge, be irritating in the oral cavity. So therefore there has been a need for the new nicotine, non-tobacco nicotine oral pouches. The first one was developed by a company in Sweden, Nikonovum, with the brand name Sonic, and that was registered as a medicinal nicotine replacement product in 2008. Absorption of nicotine is less irritating from the mucosa between the upper lip and the gum, so from that perspective, it should be a little bit more preferable to the smokers. The ingredients in Sonic, they are all grass and they are mainly uh, some kind of uh, cellulose to which the nicotine is bound, pH adjusting substances and flavors. And here to the right, I have put the market leader in the US, Sin, and its ingredients, and they are pretty much the same as they are for this NRT product, Sonic. Again, nicotine is bound to cellulose. You increase the pH, and there are flavorings. Uh, the Sonic pouch was tested uh, compared with nicotine gum on ability to reduce craving. The reduction in craving is here, and this is after 5, 10, 15 minutes. And the uh, dark blue bar is the oral nicotine pouch. Here we have the nicotine gum and the placebo pouch. And we see at all time points here, the pouch was more efficacious in relieving craving than the gum and the placebo. There has also been a study looking at its pr product preference uh, according to satisfaction, helpfulness, pleasantness of use, recommend to another, and embarrassing. And on all the variables except embarrassing, you will see that the pouch is more preferred and scoring higher than the gum and the placebo pouch. Today, the category includes many brands. We have a number of brands here, and I'm pretty sure that uh, this list is not complete. There might be more products on the market uh, as we speak here. And here we have the manufacturer of the uh, brands. Uh, so the big tobacco we also see here, Imperial, Philip Morris, and BAT. 
and some Swedish uh, companies. Pharmacokinetics is of course always important. And uh, here we can see the plasma nicotine in nanogram over time, 120 minutes. Uh, in the bottom here, we have SYN 3 milligram. The red is a snus product, the one that was awarded a modified risk tobacco status by FDA uh, General Snus. And the green is uh, nicotine gum of the four milligram strength. Here we have, sorry, SYN uh, six milligram and SYN eight milligram. And certainly all these products, maybe with the exception of SYN three milligram, give good nicotine levels and are therefore also quite popular, particularly among smokeless tobacco users. This is a very busy slide, but <clears throat> nevertheless, I included it because it is an important slide. We have 25 substances here that has a potential to be toxic. And uh, they have been analyzed for nicotine gum and nicotine lozenge. So here we have the average of the gum and lozenge, the concentration. And here we have the average of four nicotine pouches of the brand Lift. And I have put in red where the concentration of the actual substance is higher than in the pouch. And in green, the concentration is higher in the pouch than in the nicotine replacement. There are three greens, there are four reds, there are no big differences. And the take home message here is that in terms of toxicity regarding these 25 substances, there is no difference between uh, the nicotine replacement products, gum and lozenge and the nicotine pouch lift. Who is likely to use these new nicotine pouches? So here we have data from a consumer panel where they were asked of their likelihood to buy SIN, uh, e-cigarettes or NRTs. And if we look at the exclusive cigarette smokers, we see if we look at the light blue, the green and the reddish, there is about 17% or so that have an interest in buying SIN. But if we go to the smokeless tobacco users, we see that there is a much higher interest in buying SIN, something like uh, 40%. If we go to e-cigarette users, there is very little interest in buying SIN or even also NRT and to go back to cigarette smoking. So the main target group or those who have come forward and buy these products seem to be the smokeless tobacco users, which is okay, I suppose, but it would be better if the smokers were a little bit more interested. And I suppose that has to do with advertising, et cetera. And it might happen that the smokers get more interested because smoking is so much more harmful than using other smokeless tobacco products. <clears throat> Uh, there is so far very little research on this nicotine uh, pouches. And I have listed here a number of things that need to be clarified. Product chemistry, of course, is important. Uh, you all, one would like to know the pharmacokinetics. The relative safety is very important uh, relative to cigarette smoking and, and maybe other tobacco habits. Uh, but also the product itself. What is the acceptable minimum level of nicotine per pouch that can achieve a stated public health goal? This is important. Uh, we also have seen that from some countries, uh, particularly Russia, there has been some pouches 
launched on the market with very too high levels of nicotine and that can hurt the whole category. So a regulation here would be very good. One need to know about the communication around the product. Is it appropriately understood? For example, if you still smoke and just use a few nicotine oral pouches, it's not much of a harm reduction. So there need to be an entire switch uh, to, uh, for the pouches to have their full potentials. It is interesting to know about who are the intended consumers. So that are, they are cigarette smokers or users of other tobacco products. What is the likelihood of unintended use in the population? We don't want kids, adolescents to use this and possibly, although unlikely, ending up with <clears throat> smoking. We also have to be aware that there is a transition time when you try another product. You don't immediately switch to zero cigarettes. It takes some time for you to get used to the product, to like the product, and to be able to entirely use the product and, and no cigarettes. Uh, also, we would like to know if the availability of these products, if they have any effect on the uh, intention to give up smoking and, and tobacco uh, completely. Uh, abuse liability, that's uh, uh, how dependence forming are these products. Uh, I suppose they are to some degree, but I also suppose they are not as dependent producing as cigarettes or so my concluding remarks here are that the ingredients in most of the products are relatively similar to approved nicotine replacement products. And thus the toxic effect effects should also be relatively similar. With the right regulation, oral non-tobacco nicotine pouches has the potential to be harm reduction tools. Thank you for your attention. My presentation today describes favorable changes in biomarkers of potential harm when switching from cigarette smoking to using a tobacco heating product for six months. At last year's third scientific summit on tobacco harm reduction, I presented our six month biomarker of exposure results from our study on British American tobacco's tobacco heating product Glow, demonstrating that, compared to continued smoking, switching to Glow completely resulted in a statistically significant reduction in exposure to a range of toxicants classified by the United States Food and Drug Administration as respiratory, cardiovascular, reproductive and developmental toxicants and carcinogens. That most of these markers assessed reach levels similar to complete cessation, that the reductions were rapid and sustained for the six month period, concluding that these findings support GLOW as a reduced exposure tobacco product. Today, I will share with you the biomarker of potential harm results over the same six month period. In terms of study design, this was an ambulatory switching study carried out to the international standards of good clinical practice at four clinical sites in the United Kingdom. The study was registered on the ISRCTN database and the protocol was published in full in a peer reviewed journal with the reference shown here on the slide. Well, in brief, in three separate populations were recruited. Up to 280 smokers with no intent to quit, with up to 80 of those randomised to continue smoking and up to 200 to switch to using GLOW. 190 smokers intending to quit were supported in doing so with smoking cessation counselling and the option to use nicotine replacement therapy or pharmacological nicotine cessation therapy. 40 never smokers were also recruited to continue not to smoke. Participants attended the clinic approximately every 30 days for one year, though the never smokers were requested to attend less frequently. Breath, blood and urine were analysed for a range of exposure and effect biomarkers and physiological questionnaire and safety measures were also performed. 
Whilst the 12 month clinical phase of our study is complete, my presentation today is focused on the biomarker of potential harm results over the first six months of the study, visits one to seven, as indicated in the red box here. An assessment of medium to long-term compliance with smoking abstinence within the glow and cessation arms was absolutely key in order to avoid potential under-reporting of the effect cessation or switching to GLOW has on the study endpoints. Traditional, short-term measures such as expired carbon monoxide would not be appropriate as they only detect very recent smoking, whereas there are at least 30 days between visits in our study. Specific for tobacco smoke exposure, we used a haemoglobin adduct, which we abbreviate to CVAL, as a long-term biomarker of compliance in our study. Based on the life cycle of red blood cells, C valve from cigarette smoking is detectable in the blood for approximately 90 to 120 days. Based on C valve levels seen in our previous clinical study of a reduced toxicant prototype cigarette, we set thresholds for C valve levels at three months, six months, and 12 months in this study, and use these to categorize subjects in terms of their compliance with not smoking. This was pre-specified in our statistical analysis plan, which has also been published in a peer-reviewed journal. This table provides an overview of participant numbers. The total enrolled column shows the number of participants we enrolled into each study arm, with the next column showing our target for the number of compliant completers of the full 12 months. The next two columns show the numbers who reach the six-month time point and the number of withdrawals. Withdrawals include those who self-withdrew or were withdrawn from the study prior to six months for any reason. As you can see, the number completing to six months exceeded our target for each arm. This second table shows the number of participants who were compliant with the cigarette smoking restrictions in the glow and cessation arms based on pre-specified levels of CVAL in their blood. With solus use or complete smoking cessation, in the region of 75%, we still exceeded our target number of compliant completers. We assessed a range of biomarkers of potential harm, indicative of several early biological effects, functional changes, and symptoms which are associated with smoking-related disease progression. These diseases include cardiovascular disease, CVD, cancers, and lung or respiratory diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Whilst NNAL is a biomarker of exposure for the tobacco carcinogen NNK, urinary levels of NNAL are also considered a biomarker for lung cancer risk. In our study, we assess changes from baseline for each of these markers in the group of participants who switched to GLOW and compared those changes to those in participants who continued to smoke. Now to share with you some results. The graph on the left here shows the mean average changes from baseline at six months in urinary 8-epiprostaglandin F2-alpha. This is a compound produced by the body through oxidative stress, a process implicated in several smoking-related diseases, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, and lung disease such as COPD. Similarly, on the right-hand graph, Mean average changes from baseline in white blood cell count are shown. Raised white blood cell counts are indicative of general inflammation, playing a role in cardiovascular disease and carcinogenesis, with elevated levels also correlating to risk of COPD exacerbations. For both of these markers, our results following a six-month switch to GLOW, the orange bars, show a marked reduction from baseline, which is statistically significant compared to those who continued smoking, depicted by the blue bars. The markers shown in these two graphs are indicators of bronchodilation and lung health. The orange bar on the left-hand graph shows that there was a mean increase in the concentration of nitric oxide measured in the breath of participants who'd switched to GLOW for six months. Levels in this group of participants and in the group who quit tobacco use, shown by the grey bar, increase towards levels expected in people who have never smoked, whereas the blue bar shows that there was no change in those participants who continued to smoke. On the right-hand graph, 
The blue bar represents continued smoking, showing that the volume of air which participants could force from their lungs in one second at baseline had reduced by the six month time point. The grey and orange bars, which show participants who quit tobacco use and participants who switch to GLOW respectively, do not show this detrimental effect on the lungs. Raised concentrations of 11-DTX B2, a breakdown product of a major thromboxane which induces blood clotting and arterial constriction, are a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. As indicated by the grey and orange bars in the left-hand graph, our results show similar reductions in the mean concentration of this marker in participants who quit tobacco use completely or switch to GLOW for six months. High density lipoprotein, or HDL, which is sometimes referred to as good cholesterol, has athero and cardioprotective properties in helping remove other harmful lipids from the cardiovascular system. Even small increases in levels of HDL are associated with reductions in cardiovascular disease incidence. Our results in the graph on the right show an increase in levels of this marker after six months of smoking cessation or switching to GLOW. SICAM1 is found in blood plasma as a result of white blood cells attaching to dysfunctional or damaged endothelial cells. Elevated levels of SICAM1 are observed during inflammation and early atherogenesis and are predictive of cardiovascular disease risk. As indicated by the grey and orange bars in the left-hand graph, our results show reductions in the mean concentration of this marker in participants who quit tobacco use completely or switch to GLOW for six months, whereas the blue bar shows an increase in the mean concentration of this marker in subjects who continue to smoke for the same period. On the right-hand graph are our results for NNAL. This is a biomarker of exposure to the tobacco-specific nitrosamine NNK, and in last year's presentation, I described how exposure to NNK was statistically significantly reduced by three months after switching from smoking to using GLOW, compared to those who continued to smoke. But NNAL is also a potent carcinogen in its own right. Urinary NNAL levels have been shown to be higher in smokers who develop lung cancer than in those who do not. Our results show that following a six month switch to GLOW, urinary NNAL levels were greatly reduced, shown by the orange bar, compared to those in subjects who continue to smoke, depicted by the blue bar. In summary, switching to GLOW resulted in statistically significant changes in several BOPHs compared to continued smoking. The difference was significant at six months for AEPPGF, white blood cell count, and nitric oxide. For NNAL, the difference was significant when assessed at three months and was thus not statistically reassessed at six months, but the reduction was maintained for the six month period. For the majority of the markers, the effect size was similar to that seen for smoking cessation. Though not included in the formal statistical assessments, Favourable directional trends in SICAM1, HDL and FEV1 were also seen in GLOW switchers with unfavourable trends in continued smokers. This meets the standard, and arguably the gold standard in terms of similarity to cessation, proposed by the United States Institute of Medicine in their 2012 report on scientific standards for studies on modified risk tobacco products. Along with the findings for biomarkers of exposure, these data strongly suggest that the negative health impacts of cigarette smoking may be reduced in smokers who completely switch to using GLOW. Before I finish, I'd like to mention that the six-month findings from our study were published earlier this year in the journal Internal and Emergency Medicine in their topical collection titled Health Impact of Electronic Cigarettes and Tobacco Heating Systems. I would like to thank my co-authors, and we would like to thank Covance, Richmond Pharmacology, Solarian, and Simbeck for their management and conduct of the clinical phase of the study, and Covance, Solarian, and ABF for performing the bioanalysis. I also thank the session chairs and the conference hosts, organizers, and committees for allowing me to speak, and I thank you all for your attention.
My name is Stacey McCaffrey, and I am a psychometrician at Jewel Labs. Thank you for this opportunity to present my research evaluating respiratory symptoms among smokers who switch to electronic nicotine delivery systems. For adult cigarette smokers who would not otherwise quit, switching completely to ENDS may be a reduced risk alternative with significant benefits to respiratory health. If substantiated, Improvement in respiratory symptoms may be a meaningful and motivating driver for these smokers to switch completely to ENDS, as reduction in respiratory symptoms may be perceived as tangible and relatable and reflect more immediate consequences of smoking. While research supports a reduction in respiratory symptoms following smoking abstention, few studies have prospectively evaluated how smokers' respiratory symptoms are affected by complete switching from cigarettes to ENDS and some of these studies have yielded inconsistent findings. Smokers may experience mild to moderate respiratory symptoms long before the symptoms progress to the point of meeting formal diagnostic criteria for pulmonary disease. Capturing these more mild, non-clinical symptoms through self-report questionnaires presents unique challenges. Although we have a number of validated self-report measures of respiratory symptoms for individuals with clinical diseases, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, these measures may not be appropriate for smokers without clinical respiratory disease. For example, these measures include items that are too severe and or not applicable to smokers without clinical respiratory disease. This can result in reduced measurement precision and what we call a floor effect. For example, if a smoker with mild respiratory symptoms obtains a score of zero on a questionnaire at baseline of a longitudinal study, even if they experience a true decline in respiratory symptomology over time, the questionnaire would not be able to capture this change because the smoker cannot obtain a score lower than zero. Therefore, using a questionnaire with two severe items inhibits measurement of true reduction in respiratory symptoms over time. To illustrate this point, the table presented here includes items from validated, commonly used patient-reported outcome measures developed for patient populations, such as those with COPD. As you can see, these items capture respiratory symptoms reflecting quite severe pulmonary disease and do not effectively assess more mild respiratory symptoms that a smoker without COPD might be experiencing. Additionally, because these questionnaires were developed for individuals with clinical diseases, scoring and interpretation of these questionnaires may not be valid for use with non-diseased populations. Here, we present the development and validation of the Respiratory Symptom Questionnaire, a new self-report measure of respiratory symptoms appropriate for use with smokers, including those smokers who have not yet developed clinical diseases such as COPD. Development of the RSQ was led and funded by Juul Labs and data was collected by Cantar Health. As part of the RSQ validation, we compared RSQ scores of current smokers and abstainers, that is, former smokers not using any tobacco products, as an indicator of whether the RSQ is able to detect change in smoking-related respiratory symptoms that subside with smoking abstention. As research suggests that respiratory symptoms decline following smoking abstention, differences between smokers and abstainers' RSQ scores would provide support for the RSQ's ability to detect change in respiratory symptoms over time. Finally, as an exploratory analysis, we compared respiratory symptom scores of former smokers who switched to ENDS to the scores of smokers and abstainers to explore how switching to ENDS impacts respiratory symptomology. Development of the RSQ was a multi-step process. First, we drafted the initial questionnaire based on a review of relevant literature and existing measures as well as consultation with experts, including several pulmonologists. We followed best practices when drafting the initial questionnaire. For example, we use simple terminology 
and generated items that were not likely to be vulnerable to ceiling or floor effects. Next, we refined the draft questionnaire based on feedback from smokers and switchers obtained through three waves of individual semi-structured cognitive interviews. During the interview session, participants completed the draft RSQ independently, and then the interviewers went back and reviewed the RSQ with the participants, probing the participants about their experience with the questionnaire and their responses. Feedback from these interviews helped us to identify opportunities to improve the questionnaire, such as modifying item content or wording. Work from phases one and two produced a final questionnaire which adequately captured relevant symptoms and was found to be interpreted and understood as intended by end users of the questionnaire. This is the final five item respiratory symptom questionnaire it is written at a seventh grade reading level. During administration, each item is presented on a separate screen and in this fixed order. As you're looking over the RSQ, there are a few points worth mentioning. You'll notice that the RSQ asks respondents to consider the number of days in the past 30 days that they experienced various respiratory symptoms. We made the decision to assess frequency of respiratory symptoms in this manner, instead of using another metric, such as perceived severity of symptoms, based on our review of the literature and conversations with subject matter experts. Additionally, we chose 30 days as the recall period, as shorter timeframes, such as the past day or week, may not be representative of the respondent's typical level of respiratory symptoms and selecting a longer time frame, such as 60 days, could result in recall bias. Feedback from cognitive interviews indicated that participants did not have trouble recalling their symptoms over the past 30 days. The RSQ's response options include descriptors, such as never and rarely, and a range of days associated with each descriptor to remind participants that the unit is days and not simply frequency. Participant feedback obtained during the cognitive interviews was extremely helpful in helping us wordsmith the RSQ items and to generate relevant examples of normal daily activities to increase accurate interpretation of the items. For example, looking at item four, becoming easily winded during normal daily activities, Participants understood that we were interested in whether they have trouble catching their breath during more mild everyday activities where a person typically would not have trouble breathing instead of during strenuous activities such as exercise where becoming easily winded is expected. Next, we quantitatively evaluated the psychometric functioning of the RSQ. For purposes of the psychometric evaluation, we administered the RSQ as part of an online survey to 610 participants. One week later, a subset of these participants completed the RSQ a second time. As we would not expect to see much change in participants' respiratory symptoms over the course of a one-week period, we used this data to evaluate test-to-retest reliability of the RSQ scores. Participants included approximately 200 smokers, 200 switchers, and 200 abstainers. This slide provides an overview of participant characteristics. You'll notice that approximately 60% of the sample was female and the majority identified as white or Caucasian. Most frequently, participants rated their health as good on a commonly used global health item with very few participants describing their health as excellent or poor. For purposes of evaluating known groups validity of the RSQ, we aim to recruit a portion of participants with COPD or another disease with overlapping symptoms to COPD, which we refer to as respiratory symptom related diagnoses. These include allergies, obesity, asthma, and congestive heart failure. 47% of participants in this study reported having been diagnosed with one or more of the respiratory symptom-related diseases. 
the most frequently reported diagnosis was COPD, with 17% of participants in the total sample reporting a diagnosis of COPD. Of note, prevalence of COPD in this study sample is slightly lower than recent estimates of COPD prevalence among current and former smokers obtained through the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Per the study requirements, all participants reported having smoked for at least 10 years. Mean smoking history of participants in this study was 33 years. On average, smokers reported having smoked for about 42 years, while switchers and abstainers smoked for approximately 28 years. Smokers and abstainers were also older than switchers. We conducted a comprehensive psychometric evaluation of the RSQ following best practices. And this evaluation included both classical and modern test theory approaches. While details of the psychometric evaluation are beyond the scope of the current presentation, I wanna highlight a few key findings. First, results provided support for unidimensionality of the RSQ, that is, all of the items are collectively measuring a single construct. This suggests that it is appropriate to calculate a single total respiratory symptom score from the five RSQ items. We also evaluated the response categories. Specifically, we evaluated the assumption that a respondent who selects every day to an RSQ item actually has greater respiratory symptoms compared to a respondent who selects most days. Results supported this assumption, providing empirical evidence that the response categories are functioning appropriately. The RSQ scores were found to be stable over time, providing support for test retest reliability. Last, as expected, we found that RSQ scores were related to poorer self-reported global health status and that RSQ scores were higher among participants who reported having been diagnosed with COPD or another respiratory symptom-related diagnosis compared to participants without such a diagnosis. These results provide support for validity of the RSQ. Using data from the RSQ validation study, we evaluated differences in respiratory symptoms between smokers, switchers, and abstainers. First, we compared RSQ scores of current smokers and abstainers. As expected, significant differences were observed between smokers and abstainers RSQ scores. Mean RSQ scores were about a third of a point lower for abstainers on the RSQ's one to five scale, which is a small to medium effect size. This finding provides preliminary support for the RSQ's ability to detect change in respiratory symptoms over time following smoking abstention. Next, we evaluated switcher scores compared to smokers and abstainers. Switchers had significantly lower RSQ scores than smokers, and their scores did not significantly differ from abstainer scores. Specifically, we also observed about a third of a point difference in mean RSQ scores between smokers and switchers, which is highly significant. Of note, we also replicated these analyses controlling for years smoked using a regression model, and the RSQ scores of smokers and switchers and smokers and abstainers remain significantly different. This research fills an important gap in the literature by providing a valid and reliable measure of self-reported respiratory symptoms appropriate for use with smokers who have not yet developed pulmonary disease. Results from the current study provide support for the harm reduction potential of ENDS. Specifically, former smokers who switched to ENDS reported respiratory symptoms that were significantly lower than smokers' symptoms. Moreover, their level of self-reported respiratory symptoms were similar to symptoms of former smokers no longer using any tobacco products. A limitation of the current study is that it relied on self-report. Tobacco use was not biochemically verified and diagnostic status was not verified through medical chart review. 
Future longitudinal research should evaluate intra-individual change in smokers' respiratory symptoms following complete switching to N using the RSQ and in comparison to smokers who continue smoking. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Maria Qureshi. I'm currently having a research fellowship with the University of Catania in Italy. I'm extremely delighted and it is a very big honor for me to be sharing our research work with you all here. And of course, it really helps further my commitment to tobacco harm reduction. So today I will be presenting on respiratory and cardiovascular health effects of e-cigarette substitution for cigarettes, a living systematic review. So we believe that research should be completely transparent, available and accessible to everybody. So for this reason, I would like to invite you all to please go ahead and have a look at our published protocol in the Journal of Medical Internet Research Protocols, which is also available at the given DOI. So our research question is that what are the respiratory and cardiovascular health effects resulting from the substitution of electronic nicotine delivery systems for conventional cigarettes? So for all of us who are working in tobacco harm reduction, this is a very crucial, a pivotal, or rather a central question. It is a question which we are all looking for the best answer. But to find the most accurate and best answer, it remains a challenge. So many other research uh, researches have been done, systematic reviews have been done, which are trying to answer the very same question. But the problem that actually happens is that by the time most of these systematic reviews, they become available, they are published, they become outdated. The other thing is, that many of these reviews are frequently based on non-human studies. Now, this leads to inconsistent results. In comparison to all of these other systematic reviews, what is unique about our review? So our review is a living systematic review, which means that we will be keeping it updated regularly. And we will be ensuring that all new relevant and important research is brought out in a good, timely manner. So this was our PICO. Our population is adults who smoke cigarettes. The intervention was substitution of ends for cigarettes. A comparator are participants who continue to smoke or within subject changes for participants who substituted ends for smoking. The outcomes that we measured for respiratory function were changes in respiratory tests and in cardiovascular function were changes in cardiovascular tests. So the PRISMA 2020, it has been recently updated uh, to the PRISMA uh, 2020 from the PRISMA 2009. The new PRISMA, it is much more comprehensive, advanced and more modified. And this is the prisma that we utilize and we believe that it has really helped add quality to our research work. That during our research process, we extracted 33 studies with 38 publications. We used two excellent tools, the JBI tool for assessing the quality of our studies. Now, this is a very good tool because it really helps in assessing whether how reliable and how relevant and trustworthy a study is. And we also used the Oxford catalog of bias. Now this uh, catalog has more than 50 biases in them. We extracted 22 relevant biases, and then we measured the biases which were present in each study individually. We think that these two are, tools are really good and all researchers should definitely be, be using them. It would really help improve uh, the outcomes of their research. So by using these two tools, what we came across was, uh, it was really not very good news. We saw that 26 studies were rated at a high risk of bias, and we rated seven studies with some concerns. We found no studies that we could be rated at a low risk of bias. 
So the research that we actually came across, it was highly flawed. It was highly biased. Or to put it more bluntly, we found junk research. We were not able to find any conclusive answers on health outcomes. So let's move on to the tests that we looked at for measuring or for looking at the health effects of ENDS. For the respiratory studies, we basically looked at spirometry. And for cardiovascular studies, we looked at blood pressure, heart rate, flow-mediated dilatation, and electrocardiogram. We also conducted a subgroup analysis to see the changes in these tests for dual users, for those who were using these products or ENDS for more than a year. And we also looked at populations which were having an underlying disease. And we, what did we find? We saw, we found very mixed results, especially on the specific populations. Now this brings us to our results. This is definitely the most important section of our work, basically because it helps validate the fact that we really did not find any good research. So what did we actually see? We saw that there were some benefits to patients with hypertension, but with a low certainty of evidence. We saw some improvements in people with COPD who switched to ENDS use presented only in the long-term studies. Acute and short-term follow-up studies were unable to establish any health effects. A decline in further worsening of asthma in those who switched to ENDS compared to those who continued to smoke was also seen. So again, I cannot stress enough this we call, we think that what we found was highly flawed or basically junk research. To put it out there to all of you, I, I would like to ask you all, what does this actually say about our field? Where are we headed to? Are we progressing or are we going backwards in all the research which is related to tobacco harm reduction? Where are we headed? I would really like to know that. So what were the issues that actually led to all these flaws and biases in the, in the science? We found that many studies had methodological errors and reporting biases. If we talk about methodological errors, we saw that many studies did not have adequate power. We saw that studies were reporting significant p-values, but not clinically relevant outcomes, which is actually makes the results or the significance meaningless. We saw that many studies were using different ENDS models. Now this makes it very difficult to standardize results across different studies. The puffing protocol was something very interesting as well, which we came across. We saw that studies were actually having excessive exposure to, uh, to, the, to the puffs. And we saw this in three studies. We also saw that studies were utilizing very high nicotine levels. Now, with all of this, we can say that these are not real lifelike situations, which means that we cannot get real lifelike impacts or results as to how these, these devices are actually affecting the people. Another thing that we noticed were reporting biases. We saw studies with missing and discrepant data. We saw issues uh, due to deviations from protocol leading to data dredging, we saw that studies had a lot of spin bias, which is very important for conclusions. This was noted more in studies that failed to show any significant findings. Now, in end science, demonstrating that these devices have no significant difference in health effects compared to smoking is highly relevant. If the evidence is distorted, it would be depriving potential users and the clinicians of the actual findings. It means that their decisions would not be true, not true reflection of what actually is happening. 
So please, researchers, if you have a study which has no significant findings, report it as it is, as that in itself is a very important and significant finding. There are two very good study examples that I would like to quote here, which have these errors and biases. Our one study was by Flores, which reported st statistically significant p-values, but when we went deeper in the study, we saw that those p-values were meaningless because there were no clinically relevant outcomes. Also, we saw that the study failed to report the results properly. They only had bar charts and we could not see any proper values to show what the significance actually meant. Another study we saw was by Barna et al. Et al in which we saw that ENDS users were reverted to smoking cigarettes. Now this put the participants at a high risk for relapse to smoking. We really, really failed to understand how in the world this study went past ethics. And this study did have an ethical clearance. So researchers, we all really need to adhere to the ethics of research. We cannot, simply cannot harm risk to the participants. Now, this was very important that we compared our systematic reviews to other systematic reviews. So we compared, the comparison was with systematic reviews, which were not older than two years. We really wanted to highlight what our review is adding that is different and not already present. So in our systematic review, we only included human studies. We excluded cross-sectional studies as they can only show an association and not a causation. Animal studies as they do not reflect human exposure levels, which means they cannot give the evidence for presence or absence of risk. We excluded in vitro studies as they do not look at all the systems together. And we also excluded biomarker studies. Now biomarker studies only show surrogate outcomes, which do not have a predictive value for tobacco related diseases. So they do have a have a limited or a prominent role rather in screening, but that's where it ends. They, do, they have a very limited role in indicating the presence or absence of a disease. So we would like to urge all the researchers who are working in our field that we should really forget about biomarkers as they're really not useful to our research area. Another interesting thing that we noticed was that none of the other reviews had actually conducted a quality appraisal of the included studies. That is why I was stressing that we really need to start. We have excellent tools out there and we really need to start using them. None of the studies rather than just one study rather had actually um, conducted a bias, assess bias assessment of its included study. None of the other ones had. So we can say that we found that the conclusions of these reviews were very problematic. Recommendations for future research. We have a lot of recommendations by which we can actually improve the, the, the research that we are going to be producing in the future. So the randomized control trials, they should be adequately powered with an adequate control group and a longer term follow-up. Excessive compensation is actually introduces bias, especially for vulnerable participants, and this should be avoided at all costs. If you look at specific to ends, blinding and masking is very important. And whenever there is use of ad lib choice of flavors, it adds further confounding. So this also should be excluded or rather avoided. PREF protocols should confirm to the Pennsylvania University standards. Future longitudinal studies, they should actually stratify the results according to smoking behavior and history. And most importantly, populations who are heavy smokers or have failed at multiple quit attempts should be included as important research participants. So what is our conclusion? So we conclude 
that the respiratory data showed no harmful effects with ends use in healthy participants and improvements in the long-term outcomes of patients with COPD and asthma. The cardiovascular studies showed no or only a slight increase in heart rate, blood pressure with the use of ENDS, which in every case was smaller when compared to smoking. We conclude that N substitution is not harmful to health and may have some limited benefits, particularly for those with respiratory disease or hypertension. In the end, I would like to request all the researchers, we need to keep an open eye for bias research. So we should all move forward so we can find the best possible answer to understand if N substitution is a worthwhile treatment option for people who smoke. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. I am Angela van der Plas, and I am Manager of Real World Evidence and Epidemiology at Philip Morris International. Today, I will be presenting results from our time trends analysis on hospitalizations for COPD and ischemic heart disease in Japan before and after the introduction of heated tobacco products. Smoking affects the health of individuals and populations. It has been estimated that if trends continue, a billion lives will be lost to smoking in the 21st century. Tobacco harm reduction refers to strategies that reduce the health risk associated with smoking, which may involve the continued use of nicotine-containing products. Heated tobacco products heat tobacco instead of burning it, and the absence of combustion translates into a reduced exposure to harmful and potentially harmful constituents. Philip Morris International's heated tobacco product is currently marketed as ICOS in over 50 countries. While these products are not risk-free, they have the potential to give smokers the chance to switch to better products. In this talk, we will present results of our first real-world evidence analysis. As heated tobacco products become available in different markets, it is important to assess their impact on the health of the individual and the population as a whole. Real-world data can be used to look for early signals of the population health impact of introducing novel tobacco products, for example, heated tobacco products, before epidemiological data are available. The aim of these studies was to describe the rates of hospitalizations for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, COPD exacerbation, and ischemic heart disease, IHD, before and after the introduction of heated tobacco products in two Japanese databases. For these studies, we use data from the Japan Medical Data Center, which is an epidemiological receipt database that includes 7.3 million subjects. JMDC contains disease procedure diagnosis or DPC data by which the reason for hospitalization is classified under a flag, for example, main disease or causative disease and inpatient data which are not categorized by a flag and are overall more abundant. The second database was the Medical Data Vision, MDV. This database contains hospital admissions using ICD-10 codes for COPD, COPD exacerbations, and ischemic heart disease. This database includes health claims data from over 300 Japanese acute hospitals, including records for over 20 million subjects. The hospitalizations from 2013 to 2019 were aggregated by month and year, with admissions per ICD-10 code category expressed as a percentage of the total of admissions. Different models using ITS, or interrupted time series, allowed us to test the hypothesis that the introduction of heated tobacco products is associated with change in hospitalizations in terms of the intercept, mean change, and slope, changing speed. It's also flexible for adjusting for different confounders. For this analysis, we used two types of event definitions. The first one was a no-flag analysis, including all data, and the second one had only DPC data included using the causative disease flag for hospitalizations. The cutoff point was based on previously published sales data, and since heated tobacco products were introduced into the Japanese market late in 2014, it could be assumed that there is a two-year lag period. Now, let me show you the results. 
These are the data counts by endpoint by year. The study period included was from 2013 to the year 2019. Because data coverage increased substantially between 2012 and 2013. Because of the very low counts of events in the DPC data, the only analysis done using it was for the ischemic heart disease endpoints. The study period included was from 2013 to 2019 because data coverage increased 49% between 2012 and the year 2013. Both MDV and JMDC databases contain different populations. For instance, the JMDC database contains younger enrollees and a larger proportion of females than the MDV database. In terms of number of hospitalizations, the JMDC database has around one fourth of those included in the MDV database. Additionally, due to the low number of COPD exacerbations in the Japanese population in general, we added the endpoint of COPD plus lower respiratory tract infections in order to have comparable data to that seen in the MDB database. This slide shows the MDB database analysis on COPD hospital admissions adjusted for age and sex. Using the MDB data, we see a small decline in the hospitalizations due to COPD after the introduction of heated tobacco products that was not statistically significant. This slide presents the interrupted time series model adjusting for age and percentage of females using all data for COPD hospitalizations using JMDC data. The cutoff point of introducing heated tobacco products was set at January 2017 based on previously published sales data. Hospitalization rates for COPD adjusting for age and sex were significantly lower than expected. Further adjusting for other covariates such as influenza vaccination coverage and seasonality did not alter the results. The analysis for COPD exacerbations using the MDV database showed that hospitalization rates adjusting for age and sex were significantly lower than expected. Further adjusting for the covariates such as influenza vaccination coverage and seasonality did not alter the results. This slide shows the hospitalizations for COPD exacerbations, including lower respiratory tract infections in those with COPD. We observed no significant change in trends after the introduction of heated tobacco products. We also observed a small decline in the hospitalization rates for ischemic heart disease, and although the decline was not significant, it makes sense to reevaluate this endpoint after a longer follow-up post-introduction of heated tobacco products in the Japanese market. The analysis using all data from the JMDC database found a decline in the hospitalization rates for ischemic heart disease that was not statistically significant. For ischemic heart disease hospitalizations using only DPC data, we can observe an immediate increase in the rates post-heated tobacco product introduction that was statistically significant, followed by a change in slope post-heated tobacco product introduction, which was significantly different from the expected increase in trend. The analysis of the MDV data showed a significant reduction in the rate of hospitalizations for COPD exacerbation after the introduction of heated tobacco products in Japan. Small declines in the hospitalization rates for other smoking-related diseases were observed, for example, COPD old codes and ischemic heart disease, although they were not significant. The analysis of the JMDC data using all available data showed a significant reduction in the rate of hospitalizations for COPD old codes after the introduction of heated tobacco products in Japan. The small declines in the hospitalization rates for COPD exacerbation, COPD plus lower respiratory tract infection, and ischemic heart disease were not significant. The analysis, restricted to DPC data only, showed a significant reduction in the rate of hospitalizations for ischemic heart disease. Data regarding COPD endpoints were scarce, hence no meaningful interpretation can be drawn. There was a significant reduction in the rates of hospitalizations due to COPD after the introduction of heated tobacco products in Japan, when using all data and due to ischemic heart disease, when using DPC data only. 
Time trends analysis focuses on populations, but can be a useful tool in detecting potential associations between heated tobacco products and smoking related diseases. While tobacco use history is not captured in detail in hospital records, this analysis detected some encouraging trends in smoking related disease hospitalizations in Japan, which show the same trends as our previous study. Finally, there are many limitations to this type of research, such as no subject specific data, including specific exposure. And it is important to mention that the results do not indicate a causal relationship. Thank you very much for your attention. Good evening. I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee uh, for the honor invitation. I am Costella Gabriela, and for the next 15 minutes, I will uh, try to present you our study entitled Smoking Behavior of Tobacco Cigarette Smokers After Switching to Electronic Cigarette or Heated Tobacco Products During Three Years of Follow-Up. According to World Health Organization, uh, tobacco causes almost 3 million deaths from cardiovascular disease every day. In this period, Greece had the highest proportion of smokers in Europe with 37%. It is fact that uh, there has been a rapid change in the landscape of tobacco products recently. Uh, electronic cigarettes are battery-powered devices containing a heating element and liquid nicotine solution. Heat non-burned devices heat tobacco to temperatures below combustion to produce an inhaled aerosol. These products uh, have gained significant interest in international market areas. In addition, oral products such as uh, tobacco-free nicotine pouches and of course SNAS um, are also increasing in international market popularity as alternatives to smoking. The rapid increase in the use of new tobacco products uh, is a fact under the supervision of Professor Mr. Economides, who studied the acute and chronic effects of the electronic cigarette on arterial stiffness and oxidative stress on smokers who replace the conventional traditional cigarette with an electronic one. Uh, these results uh, showed that both uh, traditional cigarette and electronic cigarette uh, adversely affect arterial elasticity um, and oxidative stress burned acutely. Replacement uh, of a traditional cigarette by nicotine containing electronic cigarette resulted in a reduced central and brachial systolic blood pressure, arterial wave reflection, and oxidative stress within one month. Also, we study the effects of electronic cigarette on platelet and vascular function after four months of use. Uh, we study 40 smokers without cardiovascular disease. Those who were randomized to smoke other traditional cigarette or an electronic cigarette. And uh, the results uh, show after switching to electronic cigarette for four months, uh, that uh, the electronic cigarette has a natural effect on platelet infection, while it reduces arterial stiffness and oxidative stress compared to tobacco smoking. Moreover, we compare the effects of a heat non-burn cigarette to those of tobacco cigarette on myocardial, uh, coronary flow and vascular function, as well as on oxidative stress and platelet activation in 77 smokers, excuse me, 75 smokers. In acute phase, the uh, heat and non-burn cigarette puffing shows a less detainment effect on arterial elasticity compared to traditional cigarette and um, did not cause a further augmentation of oxidative stress burn lateral activation and exposure to carbon monoxide compared to baseline in contrast to acute smoking of a tobacco uh, cigarette. Switching from a tobacco cigarette to heat and non-burn cigarette for one month resulted in improved endothelial function 
oxidative stress burn, as well as in a reduction of clitoral activity and exposure to carbon monoxide, while cause an improvement in coronary flow reserve and myocardial work efficiency compared with tobacco smoking. A study published in uh, 2019 in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology showed similar results. Now, in this study, about our new study, the aim of this uh, study is uh, to investigate the smoking status of tobacco smokers who attended a smoking cessation program lasting a month during a three years follow-up after completion of smoking cessation program. Uh, we used a questionnaire for the data collection three years after the first visit and uh, we evaluate smoking status and quantification of use, smoking cessation attempts and performing official activity. We study 84 smokers, so, uh, to, uh, 45 from all those switched to electronic cigarette and 39 to hit uh, to uh, non burn cigarette one month after recruitment. All attended the smoking cessation clinic, uh, regretting their nicotine independence. It appeared that those who used the electronic cigarette had a lot to moderate degree of dependence uh, and those who used the heat non burn cigarette had a low degree of dependence. Uh, from those participants, uh, 77 completed the three years uh, follow-up. Among 77 participants, 23.8 uh, of the smokers had made two efforts to cease tobacco smoking smoking with aid of uh, nicotine uh, replacement therapy and uh, approved medication. Uh, during the follow-up, 13.3% of electronic cigarette users and 13.5% of heat non burned cigarette users see smoking of any smoking products. Furthermore, 40% of electronic uh, cigarette users and 24.32% uh, of uh, hidden on burnt cigarette relapse to traditional tobacco smoking. Interestingly, 24.4% uh, of electronic cigarette users had switched to hidden on burnt cigarette, but no one of the hit uh, uh, no burn tobacco cigarette users switch to electronic cigarette use at during follow up. Excuse me. Uh, in, at conclusion, at the inclusion, um, forty five point nine percent of a heat tobacco products group and the sixteenth of electronic cigarette group performed physical exercise well at the end of the follow up period. Uh, 56.7% and 67.5% uh, perform physical exercise respectively. In conclusion, this observational study shows that tobacco smokers who switch to use of electronic cigarettes or heat tobacco products achieved a similarly low percent of completed cessation of tobacco smoking and approximately one fourth of electronic cigarette use, uh, user switch to uh, heat tobacco products uh, during our three years of follow-up. Now, in this uh, study seemed that uh, some might find switching uh, to a different uh, nicotine product more acceptable or beneficial. In, uh, public health authorities in some countries, such as uh, the United Kingdom, support this approach, while other countries, such as United States, are less supportive. Uh, the most recent clinical guidelines by USA Medical Association were released in uh, 2019 by the American College of Cardiology and 2020 by the American Thoracic Society. The ACC guidelines emphasized to complete cessation of compatible products, use of FDA-approved medication, and encourages evidence-based discussion with patients 
about electron cigarettes with a goal of eventual cessation of electron cigarette use. The ATS guidelines suggest use of varenicline over the use of <coughs> electronic cigarette. And many studies are still needed to evaluate the efficacy of uh, alternative products for uh, cigarette cessation, uh, as well as intervention for cessation of novel products and multiple products uh, use. This will help providers counsel patients on tobacco use within an informed contemporary context. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I have to make some comments and questions. I don't know if, um, if uh, let's start with Gabriella. I, I, I saw Gabriella. I see, I see only Gabriella. Yeah. Uh, Gabriella, yes, Gabriella Costello. Okay. Chiara, I listen to Mr. Tobis. I, I have to make a comment. Your study is excellent. And Thank you very uh, much. my comment is this. Uh, working in a smoking cessation clinic, I face this phenomenon you find in your study. Many smokers that constitute the smoking with the new products with e-cigarettes or HD relapsed and come to the clinic in order to help them to quit smoking. But the important, another important finding is that only 30% of the, of the persons you study uh, sees completely smoking of any smoking product. And this is very important because it has been found generally that uh, the smoking cessation drugs and the visits to the smoking cessation clinics are decreased significantly because of the use of these new uh, smoking products. And it is something that is uh, negative for these new products that uh, they, without uh, doubt, they produce less toxicants and perhaps they have less harmful uh, effects on the organisms. This is my comment for you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your comment. Uh, we study. I am nice. And uh, in smoking session clinic, uh, we follow the Hello. guidelines uh, as I uh, yes. present. Thank you very much, Mr. Dubis. Okay. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, sorry, it was uh, an interruption of the Wi Fi. I am Professor Vardas, and I said that we had a the opportunity for a marvelous, uh, let's say, uh, uh, opportunity to listen six good speakers presenting different uh, systems related to uh, smoking, uh, also to electronic nicotine delivery systems experience, and then to hit tobacco products. I think uh, we are doing significant progress during the last few years in this area. Uh, uh, my comment is that uh, it's true that uh, this uh, uh, time we need uh, well-organized randomized clinical trials as one or two of the speakers had emphasized. Uh, I don't know if there is any question from the speakers to the rest of the speakers at this point of the discussion. Is any, uh, Professor Tubis, is anybody who likes to make any uh, comment or to raise any question here? Uh, Mary Parker has sent us a question for uh, Angela van der Plaats. Yeah. What is the claim important to real world data? 
can they be used at the at a large scale to draw on conclusions for this product? The question is for Angela van der Blas. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Can I can I ask uh, the uh, professor to be? I would like to uh, ask uh, all the speakers uh, uh, how uh, wh which one of the of the trials is to you the most important comparing tobacco heart reduction products with uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems. Is any really important trial of the of the last two three years? Could you asking uh, me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to address that in my yeah. talk specifically. I, I will talk about a couple of the trials. But uh, are you sure that these uh, trials are well powered to uh, be significant and reliable? There are a limited number of them that are very well done, uh, and I will talk about two of them and also point out that there is a Cochrane review that has looked at 27 trials, and I will give the conclusion from the Cochrane review as well. Yeah, because it's clear. The international regulatory authorities progressively will be much more, let's say, interested to know the power of these trials run and, the, and how much credible and reliable are they. Uh, uh, because as far as I know, a number of those have proven that both uh, hard tobacco, sorry, heat tobacco products, but also to some degree, and uh, uh, ants products uh, are uh, benef beneficial versus the classical smoking, correct? But what we need now is well-powered trials. This is my opinion as a cardiologist. As I said, I will discuss that and also the population study evidence. So I'll give you plenty of evidence to work with. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay.